Welcome to episode 41 of the G2 on 5G. It's the latest insight scoop on everything 5G. We cover six topics in about 15 minutes and it's brought to you by More Insights and Strategy. I'm Will Townsend and joining me again this week is my fellow analyst, Angel Sag. Let's get started with my first topic. And this week um, and last week, Marvell had two announcements around 5G and this is with distributed unit um, silicon. And the first one was an announcement with Fujitsu. They're a, definitely an up and comer in the Japanese market. They wanna broaden their reach as well. So they're partnering with Marvell on two initiatives. Um, one is on uh, DU um, solutions. And um, they're also gonna collaborate um, on Fujitsu 5G NR base stations. So that was the first announcement. Um, Marvell has got great capability and um, you know, Fujitsu's ability to be able to lean into Marvell I think will really give it the scale that it needs to expand beyond its core market of Japan. You know, Samsung Networks did something very similar a few years ago when they kicked off Verizon's 5G deployments. Traditionally, Samsung Networks had been relegated to the South Korean market. And so this is a way for Fujitsu to sort of grow its, uh, its, its share and it's smart from my perspective. Uh, the second announcement was related to um, Marvell joining uh, the Evenstar program. And this is driven by Facebook connectivity. Um, the organization has been um, driving um, from an open RAN perspective, um, uh, starting with the radio unit technology. Now DU comes into the fold. Again, Marvell brings lots of great capabilities with respect to DU. And I believe that this will provide um, more choices for customers. And, They'll be uh, providing reference designs and those sort of things on, on you know, on, on silicon kits. So uh, all in all, a very, very strong, you know, dual announcement from Marvell. Any thoughts? Um, not really. I think I think Marvell is kind of one of the crucial um, merchant silicon vendors when it comes to supplying um, infrastructure vendors the chipsets they need to be competitive in the market. Um, so I think. Marvell yeah. is kind of like the kingmaker in that sense that um, you know if you want to be competitive player in the market, you have to work with Marvell. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, they're they're definitely um, a lot like Qualcomm. When we talk about Qualcomm quite a bit, they're really helping drive, to drive that whole five G ecosystem. So um, I expect to see other announcements from Marvell throughout the year, and um, as they break, we'll report back. Um, let's move into your first topic this week and uh, T-Mobile announced um, a number of business uh, solutions, correct? I think it was today, wasn't it, Anshul? Yeah, so uh, at the time of this recording, uh, Thursday, we uh, did have a uh, announcement from T-Mobile that kind of, uh, I, I think, you know, made T-Mobile look like they're really going after Verizon and uh, AT&T. Uh, they have a an entire suite of work from anywhere solutions, uh, which include a new enterprise uh, 5G plan, which is fully unlimited, no overages. Uh, that's a big deal because a lot of their competitors don't offer that. Uh, and T-Mobile hasn't really even ever really pushed for enterprise right. as a plan. So they're clearly really going after these big enterprise accounts, uh, more than a thousand employees. And uh, they're also introducing a, mm -hmm. a service and a gateway for um, home office internet so that people who don't have reliable internet connections at home um, or don't have secure internet connections or don't have their own internet connection uh, are able to conduct business in a much more stable and secure manner um, than if they were to rely on Wi-Fi hotspots and old Wi-Fi infrastructure. And then they also yeah. have a collaboration solution uh, that they created in partnership with Dialpad to uh, essentially, you know, round out this enterprise solution, giving, you know, the plans, the data, the infrastructure and the software to kind of uh, give the enterprise customers what they need right now, as well as what they most likely will need in the future as their employees, yeah, yeah. you know, become more and more mobile and hybrid like. 
and yeah, no, I think it's smart. I really like the uh, that 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 gateway product, right? Because it, it provides a dedicated line, so you're not competing with kids at home that are doing distance learning or or Netflix, right? Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that if you look at how these things are moving, I think you're going to see more and more distributed uh, working. I and, agree. You know. Yeah. Sorry, I was I was just breaking up. <laughs> no, I agree. Sorry to, to cut you off there. And you know, I you know, this is awesome from my perspective because I've been somewhat critical of the company in the past before the Sprint um, acquisition that they were overly consumer focused. And I think this is a great step in the right direction. I think these are solid offerings, and um, it gives them something to build from. And I got to believe that, you know, part of, you know, um, the value in bringing Sprint into the fold was bringing some business acumen along with it. I, you and I have talked about this before. John Saw and Mishka Dinigan, um, our former Sprint executives that are very focused on, you know, driving the roadmap and also, um, you, know, you know, programs and services and, and that sort of thing based on 5G. So I think this is a positive uh, step in the right direction. We, we actually collaborated on an article that uh, that we'll be publishing on Forbes um, likely by the end of the week. So our viewers and listeners, you know, stay tuned there. So let's move to my second topic this week. And I wanna provide a recap on the Verizon for Business Analyst event. It, it was over the last two days this week um, and Tuesday and Wednesday. And, you know, a couple of things struck me um, as, you know, significant. One. Um, the company used its recently acquired Blue Jeans network platform. Um, I was quite impressed with um, just the quality um, as well as just, you know, the, the robustness of that platform. I'm a former life size executive, so I've been around Collab. And, um, and I, I think it was a solid acquisition. You know, AT&T resells Cisco's uh, WebEx solution. And so Blue Jeans obviously gives Verizon you know, very critical collab, you know, capabilities. Um, the other thing that stood out for me, and it's no secret, and I think we've talked about it in the past, Verizon's been really doubling down on mobile edge computing. And, you know, mobile edge computing, you know, putting, you know, power at the network edge where data is consumed and closer to subscribers really can supercharge a lot of use cases. And, you know, I was very impressed. I mean, it's a multi-pronged approach. They have relationships that they've recently announced with AWS. Um, they're investing a ton of dollars, you know, into this, and I think, you know, it's going to give them, you know, a significant edge <laughs> relative to their competition. Not that AT and T and and T Mobile aren't focused on that as well, but um, from my perspective, it's quite impressive. I don't know if you, I don't believe you had an opportunity to attend this week, but um, I know that you've been following Verizon. Any any thoughts? No, I think, I think Verizon's approach to edge compute and like really taking care and paying attention to a lot of use cases is, I think it's massive. Um, I think they're doing a lot of right things there. I, I just think their biggest problem is that they clearly, you know, we discussed this in the last uh, uh, podcast about the auction. I just think that they're over marketing millimeter wave. Yeah, I mean, and it's not the only, you know, piece of the puzzle there. And, you know, and not surprisingly, there was no comment on, because they're still in the quiet period on, you know, the auction and, you know, the $45 billion plus, you know, price tag that they paid for that upper yeah. mid-band spectrum. And, and here's the thing, I wasn't at the thing, but if they're in the quiet period, then that means that they can't talk about how are they going to build that out? When? Yeah. At what cost? Right. So that, right. that I think is the next natural big question um, that would have been nice to ask uh, if they were able to. Yeah, they were they were very <laughs> they were very upfront about that. And so um, but I, I spend you know a lot of time with Verizon executives, you know, and, um, you know, in the future, when I have an opportunity to, you know, to have some one on ones with some of the, the executives there, hopefully I can provide some some color and context there. So. Let's move to your second topic this week, and you want to talk about the Air Force and their exploration of 5G. Yeah, so the Air Force is obviously uh, part of the Department of Defense, um, but the Air Force is also the most sensitive arm of the military to data, 
um, and the movement of data. They're, they're kind of responsible for the cyberspace domain of um, defense. So as a result, they're naturally going to be the ones that are most interested in um, using 5G in a multitude of ways. Um, and one of the ways they want to use it is in space, um, which will be most likely um, on Earth and off Earth um, in terms of beaming data to and from Earth, as well as, you know, just stuff in space. Um, but what's interesting is um, they are asking for uh, requests uh, for information uh, from different vendors, as well as they're exploring things like millimeter wave, uh, MIMO, and RAN slicing capabilities, which means that um, they're also interest interested in network slicing, mm -hmm. as many of us are. Um, and I, I think it's I think it's a very early step, but I think uh, there's gonna the Air Force is probably gonna be one of the branches that utilizes 5G the most. Yeah, you know. I recall um, an announcement from Nokia last year where um, they were exploring, you know, how to deploy cellular networking on the moon, right? And, and certainly, you know, we've got a lot of eyeballs on what's going on Mars right now and that sort of thing. So um, it's no surprise that, um, that the Air Force would be interested in 5G and want to, you know, kind of explore this further. So as things develop, we'll, uh, we'll report back. But let me jump into my third and final topic this week. And... About a week ago, um, Salona and Encigo announced a partnership to extend the reach of private 5G networking. And I've spoken about Salona in the past. They're a startup. They are partnered with HPE. They're providing a private networking solution as a service to ease deployment. In fact, um, I'll be hosting a webinar next week on March 9th. Uh, we'll be sure to put um, a link to that registration. Um, so if any of our listeners or viewers would like to tune in and learn more about that, they'll be able to hear from myself and a Salona executive. But what I like about this partnership is that it, people know who Encigo is. I mean, they're the inventors of the, the, the MiFi, uh, formerly Novatel Wireless. And what, what Encigo has been very focused on as well um, are um, delivering solutions that are focused on the edge of the network. And so with you know, with, you know, Encigo, you know, with its hotspot capabilities and its edge um, devices, and then with Solana providing the infrastructure, it's a nice end-to-end -end story. And so, um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm quite impressed. I think anything that can ease the deployment of private networking, I think, because it's being so um, valued, you know, in the, in the media these days, you know, and certainly, you know, Ericsson and Nokia, and, you know, the, the traditional infrastructure providers are also focused on it as well. But I think, you know, you'll see more startups like Solana, um, you know, enter this space and, you know, try to try to solve the issue of how do you sort of simplify that deployment? You know, in the enterprise, everyone's familiar with Wi-Fi. It's tried and true and tested. Cellular technology is different. You know, you've got licensed spectrum and you've got other, you know, challenges that you have to contend with. But um, again, I think it's a solid partnership. I don't know if you have any thoughts on it as well. Um, I don't, but I do think it's it makes sense because um, there needs to be more comprehensive uh, addressing of private networks outside of just the uh, basic inf network infrastructure that we're all familiar with. I agree. I agree. Well, let's move to your third topic this week. And you want to talk about India and some recent spectrum auctions. Yeah, so India has uh, a, had a recent spectrum auction occur today, actually, which is, well, actually, now it's yesterday. But, um, but basically, they sold $10 billion worth of auction in two days. Um, and what's interesting is this auction is mostly for low band spectrum. Uh, it's not yet for the mid-band 5G spectrum a lot of people are expecting for, to be auctioned. And it's kind of a demonstration of um, some of the issues that, issue, that India has with, with spectrum and costs um, because this auction was expected to be a $55 billion auction. Um, there was a ton of spectrum being offered uh, across the range of between 700, 800, 900, 1800, 2100, and 2300 megahertz. Um, so there's tons of different blocks of spectrum that became available. Um, and what ended up happening is that a lot of this spectrum had a reserve price and a lot of the operators didn't want to pay it. So they ended up only auctioning uh, 
a small portion of the uh, spectrum that was up for sale, um, mm. which I think is a problem. Yeah. Um, and I think it's because I think the Indian carriers know their economics of their businesses and they can't afford to do what Verizon and AT&T just did, spending you know upwards of $81 billion as a whole between all three carriers. Um, and you know, it's probably gonna end up yeah. being a $100 billion price tag in the end. And this is not even for 5G spectrum. So I think the uh, carriers yeah. are not necessarily very enthused to blow their their um, bank on spectrum they're not going to use for 5G. They might use it for low band stuff, um, you know, just to get coverage. But the reality is that India yeah, yeah. has a continued spectrum problem, um, and they will be auctioning 3.3 to 3.6 gigahertz later in the year. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I think this auction's timing is a little weird because. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the prices are not ideal and um, there's a known auction that's going to be much more important for the long term to these operators happening later this year. So I, I think it's a very interesting situation because yeah. this is very much related to 5G, um, but it also is very much related to the issues that India has around Spectrum. Yeah, you know, and, you know, you've got to be able to monetize these investments, right? And, um you know, I agree with you that this sort of the timing seemed a little off. Um, you know, certainly, you know, India, you know, is somewhat, you know, behind other parts of the world with respect to, you know, getting 5G off the ground. I'd say one of the other challenges too, I mean, you do have a lot of business opportunity in India, but, but that addressable market is likely smaller than say the addressable market that an AT&T or a Verizon has in, in the United States. And so, um, they, they got to, to your point, they can't blow the bank. They've got to, you know, they've got to control, you know, their, their, their CapEx line and their OpEx line. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how these future um, uh, spectrum auctions in India roll out. But hey, buddy, another great podcast this week. I apologize for my poor internet connection. I don't know what's been going on, but uh, why don't you take us home? Absolutely. We hope our viewers and listeners this for the, found this week's topics interesting. If anyone out there would like to provide us on, with specific uh, 5G topic for a future podcast you would like for us to cover, please reach out to us on social media. Will is at Will Town Tech and I'm at Anshel Sag. We hope you have a great weekend and please tune in again next week.